Get ready to meet the trailblazers driving the human change behind our clean energy future. This week, our trailblazer is Eric Anderson, the chief executive officer and co-founder of European Energy and one of the earliest champions paving the way to a 100% renewable future. Eric was sketching plans for wind turbines back in school and today he's building multi-billion dollar wind and solar farms across the world, including the largest solar enterprise globally in Denmark. I hope you enjoy the story of this humble entrepreneur on a mission to power the world. We're here to fuel a new energy conversation and it starts with you. Well, Eric Anderson, it is such a delight to have you as part of the Trailblazers series. Thank you so much to say, for saying yes and for joining this conversation. I found it really interesting researching you. I read that you started drawing images of wind turbines as a teenager. And I feel like that's not an everyday thing for a teenager to be doing, to be sketching uh, these images of, of you know, the energy system and what it might look like. Where did your fascination with energy come from? Where did that passion start? Um, I think the first passion for... Renewable energy came um, when I actually joined uh, the Danish Technical University for studying uh, engineering. Um, and um, more or less at the same time, at least in Europe, we had the problem with uh, non-driving days due to oil, the oil crisis. Um, it was the late 70s uh, where we had to have a huge shortage in, in oil. And, and uh, it showed uh, how dependent, for instance, Europe was from import of energy from, from the outside, from the Middle East, from Russia, etc. And that was the first, uh, let's say, remark that, that something was wrong. Uh, at that time, I have to admit, I was not thinking so much of the CO2 emissions. It was more a supply and independence, uh, uh, to be independent on your energy supply in, in Europe. That was more the the idea at that time, it was not so much the emission part of it. For those who aren't familiar, can you talk to us about what driving days meant? Talk, take us back to that crisis and that shortage at that moment in, in your life. Yeah, I mean, as I said, at least here in Europe, uh, we, we were simply forbidden uh, to drive in our private cars on Sundays to save fuel, to save uh, oil. And, and uh, that showed very clearly that the Western world uh, was dependent on, on this uh, crucial resource. And um, yeah, so that, that was the trigger. Uh, so the trigger for actually for me going into this was to say, okay, we need to be independent. If we want to utilize energy in our daily life, we also need to generate energy uh, to supply what we need. Uh, and so that was the, this independent statement that was the trigger. Um, then later on, <laughs> Uh, emission and uh, climate change and all that uh, was the headline and, and I was more or less drawn into that but, but, but in the beginning it was more the independent uh, independency which was the driver uh, for my interest. So at that moment in time when you stumble upon that supply issue where do you go seeking uh, expertise and guidance who do you turn to to learn from at a moment in time where this, this industry this thinking is pretty nascent? Yeah I mean we <laughs> We are, we are now back in, in the late 70s, beginning, beginning of the 80s, and, and um, parallel to this shortage of uh, oil supply, um, actually the wind energy sector was popping up in Denmark. And as I was uh, studying um, uh, as a relatively young man at the Danish Technical University, uh, we simply um, defined uh, courses, individual courses at the university uh, to find out, okay, what is actually the wind turbine? Why the heck does it turn? And how can we improve the efficiency of a wind turbine? How can we actually build wind turbines? And at that time, um, there was actually a, a complete start of, of uh, renewable companies making wind turbines uh, in, in, in Denmark. And I, I was kind of at, at, attracted to that whole movement of, of, of building, constructing, optimizing wind turbines. Uh, now we are in, in the early 80s, so it's a long time back. True trailblazer, absolutely. And I wanted to ask you, you mentioned it started as a supply curiosity or fascination for you. Was there a moment you can remember where all of a sudden you started thinking about CO2 emissions and that, that whole dimension of the conversation? <clears throat> 
I, I will say that uh, the whole emission question, the whole emission problem, at least, I think we were at least in the, in the 90s before uh, it really became a, 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 a subject which, which uh, maybe became bigger than, um, than the independence uh, question which was uh, at, triggering the first interest. So I think we were somewhere in the mid late 90s before the, the whole emission thing uh, became my personal headline. And when you reflect on uh, saying, you know, starting really your curiosity in this space in the late 70s, we're now in 2021. How do you reflect on the progress that has and hasn't been made over your career? Do you think, are you surprised by it being slower or faster than it is? I'd just be interested for your observations. Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the whole technology uh, development and improvements over the years has been just fantastic. I mean, the first turbine we built um, on a farm here in Denmark, uh, a group of students, I think we were around seven students, uh, which uh, during our summer holiday, we had a break of two months. We said, okay, why don't we build a turbine? And that turbine had a, a rotor diameter, a rotor diameter of uh, 11 meter. Today's large-scale uh, offshore wind turbine have a rotor diameter of 240 meter. So that shows a little bit how the development has been and uh, the capacity we had for the first homemade uh, turbine was around 11 kilowatt. Now turbines large-scale have a capacity of 15 megawatt. So, so the scaling and the technology has improved so significantly over those many years that we now actually have a, a a technology level where we actually we are able to generate the cheapest energy. The cheapest energy today comes from renewable and that, that's a fantastic story from the early days where, where the industry was heavily dependent on subsidies to now it's a pure market driven environment. And I want to talk about that whole story of what you've developed and the business model you've created around European energy. Can you take us back to when you started it? So early 2000s, why the decision to start European energy? What were you seeking to disrupt and achieve? Yeah, when we started European energy, that was around 2004. The idea was to uh, install capacity, wind capacity uh, here in Europe. Um, I mean, my, my background, as I said, was, was from the wind side, and as a Dane, uh, wind is very uh, the, the, the most obvious renewable source because we have a lot of wind in Denmark. So, so the idea when we started European Energy was simply to deploy uh, wind turbines uh, in, in, in Germany. So that was the first market. So we started off in Germany also because the regulatory frame for installing turbines, <clears throat> getting a tariff when you connect and feed into the grid, getting financing, etc., was very well defined in Germany. And therefore we said it was a startup company, uh, let's, let's go Germany because Germany is so well regulated. So that was the, the, the first uh, country we entered into uh, in 2004. Excellent. And can I ask, you know, you've said on your company's website, your mission is all about, you know, assisting, being a significant force in the global transition, you know, in tackling climate change. You want to be at the forefront of that. When you start an organisation with that being your reason for being, what do you have to be so intentional, intentional about sort of baking into the foundations and your strategy from the get go? How, how did you think about the way that you wanted to build European energy to have that um, level of contribution to climate change? Yeah, I mean, for us, scale is uh, one important uh, factor in the whole rollout of renewable energy. Uh, today, after these many years, uh, unfortunately, only somewhere between 2 to 3% of the total energy consumption, not just the electricity consumption, but the total energy originates from either uh, PV or solar, or wind. So we are only at a level of two to three percent, which actually comes from these two natural resources, and that's that's very very little. That means we need scale, um, and uh, that that is that's our contribution now is to provide scale. Uh, so that means that we have a relatively large greenfield pipeline uh, covering the whole uh, part of Europe. Uh, we are in Australia. We are in in Brazil. We are in the U.S. and <clears throat> Totally, we now work on a, a, a greenfield pipeline, a gross pipeline in the neighborhood of 30 gigawatt, uh, which generates uh, 
permits for construction of new uh, uh, wind farms and, and PV plants in a neighborhood of 1.2, 1.3 giga, gigawatt annually. So we, the, the, what the aim for our company now is to develop, but also to construct and grid connect somewhere between one to 1.5 gigawatt annually. That, that is uh, simply to, 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 to get scale um, um, and, 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 and deploy more and more wind and PV out there on a global scale, actually. And for those who may not be as familiar with it, what can a gigawatt do? Can you place that in a sense of capacity that gives to power households and, uh, and the like? What does a gigawatt mean? A gigawatt, <clears throat> is, is, uh, a gigawatt of new capacity is uh, close to a million homes. That's supply of one million homes. Um, yeah, a normal household in Australia, a normal household here in Europe. Uh, so that's the equivalent of, of one million uh, private houses. And when you think about two to three percent of current global energy production coming from uh, wind and solar, where do you think when we talk about scale, where should that be? What are your aspirations at kind of a macro level for what you think wind and solar can be producing to the future state of energy? Yeah, basically, I mean, today's technology um, is relatively flexible. We can deploy on land, so we actually we, we need a lot of hectares. Um, and uh, there is actually a lot of hectares uh, around the globe uh, which, which uh, can be utilized for, for that, where the natural resource is, is good. You can take Northern Africa, you can take Mexico, Brazil, Australia. We have a lot of land. So land resources is, uh, is in my view, sufficient. Uh, the more scarce resources may be the access to the grid. I mean, when you actually dig into it, you will see that the grid infrastructure in many countries lacks a little bit uh, the development that we like to see, where we like to electrify uh, our whole energy system. And to, to have that, you need a strong infrastructure, you need a strong grid. And in many countries, uh, this is uh, not the case today. So the authorities and the companies really have to work on the grid infrastructure to, to, uh, to comply with the deployment of renewable uh, generators. Yeah, and that makes sense. I was going to ask you, you know, what is it that stopped a more significant uptake? Is there anything else you'd name aside from the grid scale challenges and the capacity building that needs to happen there from an infrastructure standpoint? Yeah, I think the, the battles that, that we see, I mean, I think technology, as I said earlier, uh, has improved so significantly that we actually have a very, very strong technology platform, both on the, the solar side, uh, and but also on the wind side. So, so it's not that we need to go out and make a lot of new inventions to, to, uh, to, uh, to have, uh, let's say, uh, competitive uh, generators, uh, renewable generators. That, that technology has improved so much, so much over the last 30 years that they are quite competitive. Um, <clears throat> so the, I think the two battles that we have right now is actually the, uh, the grid, uh, the, the lack of uh, grid connection capacities and resources. Uh, now we, we talk about a global scale. And secondly, uh, we see in many countries that there are delays in getting the permits for actually installing renewable energy. And, and there we need to have a discussion because very, very often uh, nature interest blocks, uh, let's say, the deployment of new um, <clears throat> uh, renewable energy uh, projects. So, so we have a little bit two interests. We have the protection of nature interest, and, and then we have the whole climate agenda. And these two agendas uh, from time to time clashes. And, and we need to, to, to have a discussion with ourselves. Do we actually have a nature if our climate goes bananas? Do we then still have a nature? And how do we rank these two uh, priorities, nature priority, and a climate priority. I think that um, there have been a strong movement across the globe to actually do something to protect nature. But right now, where we also need to look at our climate, we need to, to have a more direct dialogue between these two fronts, the nature front and the climate front. Because I think actually, when you sit down and take a cup of coffee, these two, <laughs> advocates that they will see that uh, we have so much that we, we share that our end vision for, for this planet uh, is actually the same. Um, but in, in, in practice, you have a lot of delays out there simply because these two positions are clashing. 
I love that point around, you know, sitting down and having a cup of coffee and getting these views to talk so we can arrive at some common ground. And it was one of the things that struck me reading about your solar farm work, the biggest solar farm that you've got underway in Northern Europe. Last year, you spoke about how that was a result of collaboration between the municipality, between farmers, between your company. Um, and really, I'd love to learn from you. What have you found about how to achieve common ground where perhaps on the face of it, there may not be any or it may not be obvious? Um, can you tell us what's been at the heart of driving good collaboration uh, amongst your organisation and the stakeholders that is necessary to get this stuff off the ground? It very much um, is to start the dialogue early in the process. I mean, and, and that is maybe on let's, we, we look at ourselves as developers, so we are doing new projects, and, and as we have a lot of projects ongoing, um, we maybe sometimes forget to involve the local um, neighbors early in the development, because there could be a lot of other reasons why a project fails. So sometimes uh, we maybe wait a little bit to engage the local community in the discussion because we will see, okay, is there any chance that we are all can get grid capacity for our project, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is, it is important to take the local community, to take the dialogue with them as early as possible in the project. If you build a three or 500 megawatt solar plant, it takes up three to 500 hectares of land that means that has an impact on the local community. That has a visual impact. And, and uh, yeah, people, uh, it's simply big. <laughs> a 500 megawatt PV plant is simply a huge infrastructural um, yeah, asset in, in, uh, in your community. So, so of course, uh, you will have an opinion on it and you should listen. And there's a lot of questions, um, a lot of question marks, so to say, from, from the local community. So, so involvement and communication transparency is key to a successful project. I love that piece around inviting those questions early and making sure those conversations are open as early in the process as possible. The other thing that strikes me when you're talking about infrastructure and permits is sort of the leadership logjam on a lot of these sorts of topics. I wanted to ask you, you know, in order to really accelerate, you know, energy transition, energy transformation, do we need a new type of leadership? Do we need more different leadership skills coming to the fore more, particularly perhaps in public office? I think in many countries, um, the politicians, they know a little bit what they have. Um, they know what the current energy supply generates of um, labor opportunities, etc., etc. So they, they, they know what they have. And to make a transition to something new, uh, what will then the impact be on the local economy, what the impact be on, uh, on the labor market, etc., etc., and there we maybe also have from our end to say we bring something new, how will we contribute uh, to local jobs, how will we contribute to local taxes, how will we contribute to the local economy in general, both in the construction phase but also later when we come to the, uh, to the operation phase. I mean our plants would typically operate for the next 30 years after the COD, after we grid connect, and, and we simply need to be better to, to uh, explain what do we bring ex besides the clean energy. And, and that maybe in some uh, areas of the globe uh, brings a little bit of uncertainty on the political front because um, they say no to something, more of, this, more of the fossil part, and then they should say yes to our part, but what are we actually bringing except uh, we bring these green electrons? I mean, what more can we bring to the table? And, and we see some uncertainty at the political front in many areas of the world, um, yeah, due to simply jobs, uh, lo the, the fear of losing jobs. Take Poland, which have a huge coal industry. If they should deploy a lot of wind and PV in Poland, then they should maybe shut down some of these coal mines. That means they will potentially lose jobs. But if you just take the U.S. PV industry right now, they have more than close to 300,000 people employed installing PV. So you're also bringing some new jobs uh, with this new technology. So, and we need to tell that story and we need to show the balance between what you are give away uh, of jobs and what you actually create. Mm. I think that's such a great point. You know, the story that you were telling or the story that's being heard 
and making sure that it's emphasizing a clean energy plus, you know, in terms of all the other benefits economically and jobs wise. And I want to double click if I can for a second on the economic side and talk about the commerciality of things. You've mentioned that wind and solar power are fully price competitive compared to coal and oil and gas and that your company is working really hard right now to make sure that newly installed wind and solar farms are price competitive with existing coal and gas generations. Can you talk to us about where that's at in terms of price competitiveness at the moment, but also your belief about how important it is that it's the market, not the taxpayer, that you know ultimately holds the solution here to climate change? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we have... Um, we have had a tremendous uh, development. Um, I mean, uh, I've just given an example. When we started in Spain uh, back in um, in 2008, uh, our projects were heavily subsidized, and and uh, also, um, I mean, there were, there were no chance that anyone could install a PV panel in Spain even with this uh, high irradiation potential Spain has on the, on the solar side. Uh, but no one could install a single panel in Spain without a, a state subsidy. And then now, um, yeah, what is it, 13 years later or something like that, we have seen a, a constant annual decrease in cost. So from 2008, as a reference, let's call it index 100, we are now down to index 6. So that means we are only at 6% of the cost was it was back in 2008 to install one megawatt of cap capacity. And we can feed directly into the grid in Spain without any kind of subsidy. Where we in 2008 at the index 100 were heavily dependent on the state. Now we are totally independent of the Spanish state when we connect a new PV plant. Uh, and we only pay 6% of what we paid uh, back then in 2008. We have seen an almost similar uh, development within wind, not so heavy because wind was also cheaper in 2008 than PV, but the constant cost down, cost down, cost down, which comes out from technology development and comes out from the scaling, that the scale has, has grown significantly. I mean, just on the PV side, uh, the growth rate globally in installed capacity in the, is in the neighborhood of 30% annually. So you have a sector which grows 30% a year, more or less on a constant base. That's remarkable. And I, I wanted to ask, when you were think, talking there about subsidies, I'm thinking, uh, you know, they've got a bad name sometimes. How important is that interplay and that subsidy process, particularly with the high research and development costs that are often involved in, you know, considerable infrastructure projects like the ones you're working on? How important are subsidies being directed in these areas so that we do get the advent of new technology and we can speed up that development cycle? Yeah, I think if you take uh, PV and, and, and wind, um, I think the industry is driving the development at the moment. So I don't think that the industry is dependent on the technology front uh, and actually on, on state support. If you take some of the newer areas like power x where we're also heavily involved, uh, that, that's a completely new, a, a new game. I mean, uh, power x um, is um, an area where this optimization and constant cost down we have seen on wind and solar have only started. And there, I think, a governmental support, at least between now and 2025, will, 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 be <clears throat> will facilitate a, a quicker rollout of uh, Power2X technologies. And when I talk about Power2X, I talk about the ability to create e-fuels for the heavy transport. So it could be um, aviation, uh, it could be uh, ships, it could be uh, trucks. So these areas which right now have a little bit difficulties utilizing batteries, these three heavy transport areas potentially need e-fuels and they can be generated out of power trucks projects, which is a new thing. And there I think some governmental support at least for the first five, six years will be needed. Yeah, and I know your organisation's playing in green bonds and the like in terms of, you know, different financing structures to actually support aspiration, growth and scale. Can you talk to us about the innovation you're seeing there and that you're driving there? Yeah, I mean, we have, <clears throat> we, of course, uh, as a startup company, we were from the beginning uh, heavily dependent on, um, on banks and financing, uh, maybe just to, <laughs> to give it, <laughs> just to, to show the perspective. 
Uh, I mean, when we started out, we, we injected around 5 million euros in, in our company to have some start capital. Uh, and today, we are constructing projects uh, with a capital expenditure of 1, 1 billion euro uh, in, in, in 2021-2022. So, we will, we, we, we so we're going from 5 million euros to five, 1 billion euros uh, in, uh, from, from started. So the energy sector is uh, extremely capital intensive and we use a lot of uh, several instruments to facilitate the, the, the capital needs for, for our projects. Um, one of course, we make normal project financing with our banks. <clears throat> then we issue green bonds, and that has been a very, very good experience for us. We issued the first green bonds, I think, four or five years back, and we have recently issued uh, 300 million at the Nasdaq exchange here in, in, in Copenhagen. Um, and the interest from the investors was, uh, yeah, e extremely good. Uh, so, so uh, green bonds, the issue of green bonds is one way to facilitate the financing of, of the rollout of these new green technologies. And when you talk about that growth curve, I mean, it, it's sort of, uh, it, it's amazing. You're quite nonchalant about growing from sort of 5 million euros at the start to billion dollar projects. It's a pretty rapid growth curve when you now think about your organization, you know, having completed more than 100 wind and solar projects across 11 countries. For you as the leader, what's been the most challenging part of the journey that you've been on with European energy? Yeah, I think the most challenge uh, problem we have from the start and also now is uh, to assess risk. Um, <laughs> when you're a small company growing fast, there are always a lot of challenges, but in the end, you have to pay your bills, you have to pay your salary. And, and that means um, <laughs> if you make a lot of mistakes, if you make a lot of falls, you'll be delayed and the cash flow will not come, etc., etc. And in that sense, to choose the right projects and take the right decision and assess the risk in a given situation has actually been a key uh, for our company uh, to say, okay, should we go left or right uh, with this set of uh, parameters that, that we have in front of us? And uh, so that, that, that is one part. The other part is, of course, I mean, we have grown with yeah, 110 people this year and we have around 50 open positions. So we also add, <clears throat> add more and more staff and to build up the organization structure uh, and to, to have more and more local offices uh, and to see the interface between a local office in Milan or Barcelona uh, Warsaw and, and, and Copenhagen to see that how the, the interaction between the local offices and the headquarter and what functions should be facilitated in the local office and what functions should be facilitated in, in the headquarter. All that uh, is of course also a challenge but I think the overall uh, biggest uh, challenge we have had is to assess risk in the given situation. I think that's such a great call out. And there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are innovators in their field or who are trying to be the innovators inside their organization and their field. So that risk point, I'm sure, will resonate. Can you offer any advice on what you've learned through your journey so far about how to judge it right? Any tricks or tips that you might be able to offer? I think the, the most uh, simple advice uh, I can give uh, is listen to your stomach. <laughs> If you, don't have a, if, you, if you don't have a good stomach feeling in a given situation, then uh, don't move. I mean, wait until your stomach feeling is, is, is the right one. That, that sounds maybe a little bit humble, <laughs> but, but I, I think the stomach feeling is quite good. And then have good colleagues around you who can challenge any decision you take. So, so uh, you take maybe a, 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 a new round uh, with your nearest colleagues to, to, to say, okay, are we actually going left or right here? And, and when everyone nods and say, okay, we go, we, go, we go left here, okay, then we go left. So take that extra round with your closest colleagues, listen to your stomach and then move. I love that. Great advice. Now, I wanted to touch on your global expansion. You mentioned, you know, how rapidly you're growing the team and, you know, this idea you've got 50 open places at the moment. You've got projects, you know, 11 countries in Europe, Brazil, Australia, the US. Can you give us a sense of just how 
at, at that stomach feeling, which is a phrase I'm going to steal from you. I love that. Um, any observations about just the different pace and way that these countries are moving? Um, any lessons in kind of navigating very different political environments, very different regulatory environments? You know, there's certainly not a one size fits all approach to, you know, future energy state, clean energy, uh, you, you name it really across those countries. So how do you how do you navigate that? Yeah, but that, that's exactly what you point out here is the, the reason why we are quite diverse in terms of countries. I mean, uh, it have, had been significantly easier for us just to focus on one country, maybe two countries. And say, okay, now we go deep in Germany or Poland and Germany and then stay there. Uh, the fact is that, exactly as you said, that the regulatory frames for, for this development is defined by politicians and politicians come and politicians go and I mean direction, political re directions also can shift over time. So have a pool of countries where you're working in parallel with a relatively huge pipeline, you will actually mitigate all these stop-go effects. It might be that Poland is standing for a while, then UK is moving. It might be UK is standing and then Spain is moving. So having this uh, multi-country uh, focus as we have, and also to some extent uh, multi-technology uh, focus, I mean, you will see that all the time something is moving, but also all the time something is standing. So these stop-go effects can be mitigated by having a diverse approach. I like that hedging piece. The other thing that struck me, you were talking earlier about kind of the 30 year timeline that a lot of these projects have once they're connected to the grid. And when you're talking about politics, I'm thinking about all these short term election cycles and then also the reality you're running a company, you've got quarterly reports, you've got you know annual responsibilities, uh, you name it. How do you navigate that tension in terms of kind of you are building the future and at the same time having to very much live in the present political reality and commercial reality? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that 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 that's that's correct, and that's uh, that's always a balance. Um, I think it's also a little bit of dividing your own focus. Um, I I'm myself as I, I have an Indian background, so I'm extremely focused on the next technology uh, popping up uh, on the PV side, on the storage side, or power tracks or whatever. And then I have colleagues who are maybe more focused on financials and, and keeping track of all the numbers. So it's a little bit to divide uh, the, the, the focuses among your closest colleagues. And then, of course, gather all these informations and, and then move, uh, move forward, so to say. But of course, there, 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 there are several fronts that you have to address at the same time when you're growing. Definitely. We are growing with 400% this year. I mean, we are, we are installing 400% more new capacity in 2021 than we did in 2020. So we are operating at uh, 25 construction sites in parallel in seven countries at the moment. And that, that, is, uh, that is a challenge because transportation is not easy. I think you have heard about containers, shortages and, and capacity on, on, on container ships. We are, we, are, we are really having a lot of transports uh, from, from Asia to Europe with, with goods uh, that we need for, for our, our installations. And uh, we, we see huge challenges there. We see steel prices has gone uh, through the roof, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of, of challenges um, that we are facing at the moment, but take them one by one and then small steps move forward. 400% is an extraordinary growth rate. I mean, is that what you forecast? Is that what you say year on year moving forward? What do you, what do you put 400% down to? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I think <clears throat> our ambition is to have a growth rate uh, and when I talk about growth, I mean construction growth, a number of megawatt new capacity that we install to facilitate the green transition. And there, it might be that we have from 2020 to 21 had this uh, 400%, but I think going forward, 2021 to 22, I think we will be in the neighborhood of 30% in growth. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say 30% growth, but it's sometimes a little bit more difficult actually to, to deliver on 30% growth. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned earlier, it struck me, you said you're sort of the one of the team that's really excited around what technologies around the corner, what's coming next. 
Talk to us about that technology. I mean, there's a lot of talk even around the, the spacecraft and the solar panels on those and the efficiency growth that we're seeing there. 40% efficiencies versus, you know, 20%, you know, in some commercial solar panels. Where are you excited about where the technology is heading next? What should people be paying attention to? Yeah, I think um, the, the roadmap we see for both PV and, and, and wind is this steady improvement. Turbines become larger and larger. By that, they're able to generate more and more efficient. By that, they're able to deliver a lower cost of, of energy. So, so, so that follows both PV and wind uh, at the generation level. And we are not at the end of the technology possibilities within these two sectors. Both the PV are constantly improving, and the same goes for wind. So, so the two generate, the two, let's say, basic technologies generating energy, they are on track to have an annual improvement, have an annual cost down uh, for, 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 for the energy generated. So, so that, that, that's fine. Where we see a lot of new stuff which can, can change um, the, 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 the game is actually more on the intermittency and the, uh, the, the storage, uh, both on the battery side, due to the rollout of uh, EVs uh, globally, uh, which now really have gained momentum. Uh, I mean, yeah, just in my neighborhood, I think during the last year, I think three or four of my neighbors have, have got a Tesla. Uh, I got my Tesla in 15, but now it's rolling out and I see more and more uh, people actually buy an electric vehicle. And, and uh, so that driver will, of course, impact the uh, development of storage technology. And what, what we are lacking with the renewable transition is actually the intermittency um, that, we can, that we actually can cope with the intermittency from our sources that typical what people would say, well, the sun is not shining all the time, the wind is not blowing all the time. No, no, we need, we need some storage facilities. And I think on that front, we see extremely positive developments. Uh, the number of money <clears throat> injected into research and development winning uh, batteries are enormous. I think that's one of the heaviest, um, uh, let's say, invested areas at the moment. Uh, and we see actually good results. Of course, it takes time from the lab results to the production uh, rolling, uh, but, but uh, I'm quite optimistic that we will see groundbreaking uh, technologies within the, the storage uh, scene, within the ba battery side. And then, of course, PowerTrax, as we discussed a little bit earlier, also see a, a, a very, very good momentum there. And I'm sure PowerTrax will, will have a breakthrough already in the mid of this, uh, around 2025, we really see that the power tricks uh, will, will become a factor in, in the transition. Awesome. And I know, um, you know, you two mentioned their groundbreaking research, groundbreaking, you know, new production. Uh, one of the things I know your organization is doing is you're funding a PhD position, you know, in order to make sure some of that research comes to fruition. Can you talk to us about why you've chosen to get involved in academia and what you're focusing the research on to drive future value? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we are, of course, um, heavily dependent on uh, our subcontractors who are delivering uh, wind turbines or PV panels, etc., etc. But there are areas where we think we can actually contribute ourselves by doing our own in-house in research. And that, that goes, for instance, right now, we are doing floating PV. Uh, we think that it would be great to take uh, PV panels, not just on shore, but take them offshore, uh, I mean, if you take the globe uh, and look at the largest areas you have, is actually the, uh, the oceans. And if you actually can build out PV on the oceans, uh, then you will have, uh, yeah, you, you, will have, you can really build scale. So, so we are working on floating PV, uh, which we think could be a very, very interesting uh, area. Then we are looking at a lot of agri-PV, where you try to combine uh, the growth of crops, uh, agricultural activities at the same time have let's say, uh, energy production. So the combination of agriculture and, and uh, energy. So it's not either or. Very often you hear the argument, oh, why should we have all these large scale PV plants when we should also feed our children with, with the crops who should grow on the same fields. So um, we try to combine these two because we don't think there's, uh, uh, we think it's feasible actually to, uh, to combine agricultural activities and uh, 
energy uh, harvesting at the same time. Eric, you've touched on the role of technology a number of times through our conversation today. When we're talking about what it is that, you know, people who are wanting to play a role in the future of energy, people who are studying energy right now are going, I want to play a role, I want to start a business, I want to set myself up for a career, making a contribution to climate change. What skills do you think are going to be even more important as we think about the energy transition moving forward? What are you hiring for or what trends can you see when it comes to skills? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think the good message here is that, um, I mean, you can contribute uh, to the green transition with whatever background you have. You just have to be open to the agenda. I mean, if you have studied law, I can just say that we need a lot of good lawyers. <laughs> if you're an engineer, that's fine. We need you as well. If you're more practical oriented and you're good talking to neighbors and, and can go out and, and gather uh, a, a session, uh, information session with, with some local farmers, that's also very much needed. So I will more or less say whatever background you have, whatever interest you have, you can contribute to this transition. So um, it's not that this is only one type of uh, background or qualification which can drive this. I mean, whatever. I mean, also in our company, we have, I think we have 26 nationalities working. And um, I mean, the background, the educational background is extremely wide. Uh, so so um, if, you, if you want to participate, I'm, I'm sure you can contribute. I love that. And diversity and inclusion in terms of perspectives and skills and cultural backgrounds is certainly something I've really taken from our conversation today as being at the heart of the way European energy do things and very much how you see yourselves positioning for future success. Eric, I want to take you to, to COP. We're heading into obviously that global gathering again as we'll get governments and scientists and businesses alike gathering to talk about climate change. What is your hope for that conversation? Are you optimistic about it? And what do you think success would look like at this year's dialogue? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think I'm a born optimist. So even that um, some of the previous um, COP sessions has been, I mean, there have been a lot of expectations and, and very often we have seen uh, maybe that the outcome has been less than what we have hoped for. I'm still optimistic because if you take some of the overall trends right now, look just at the build out of renewable energy in China. Look at that. It's quite enormous what, what that nation is actually right now constructing of wind farms and PV plants. Um, look at the US with the new uh, president. And look at the signals about the infrastructure build out and, and the, the green agenda and the aim to build out 55% PV uh, for the electricity. Um, I mean, that was not something which was heard under the previous president. So, so that's a little, and look at Europe, where we have the uh, restart packages, which are earmarked for the green transition for, for big, uh, I think 30, 33% of, of the restart packages are earmarked for green transition. So actually it might be that we have the hype up to the COP sessions, then right after when we look at the, the final wording of the text, uh, we are a little bit disappointed, but the reality is that it's also a big transition. It's not something you do overnight and it takes time before this is implemented in all uh, the institution. So, so I think the momentum is there. So I expect that the, the, this COP um, will be sent a very ambitious signal for the world. That, that's my expectation. I find that very encouraging. Now, I'm mindful that our conversation is drawing to a close and we've covered an extraordinary amount of territory in what we've talked about. For listeners who are leaders from across all walks of life who have a passion for being the change that they want to see in the future state of the world and making a contribution to climate change and understanding the significance of this conversation for each and every one of us, uh, what would you like to leave them with an, a message around? What would you like to encourage them to go do or to go question or to think deeply about? To do something is, is, is to show the example is maybe the most, most uh, important right now. Go out and do it. Um, I think that, that is the, uh, that's the message and it is actually possible. It is possible to look at your 
house, see if I can install a few panels on my roof. It is, it is possible to engage with, with, with the local community. Okay, can we do something together? Uh, can we have a, a kind of a district heating or other facilities which can, 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 where we can join the, the, this transition? So you can, as a citizen can do a lot actually. Uh, also small enterprises can do a lot. And we see actually that's happening at the moment. So um, I think there is hope, there's a big hope that this will happen. I love that. that you can do a lot, so at least do a bit. That's kind of the, the mantra that I take from Eric's closing remarks there. Eric, it is absolutely inspiring what you and the team at European Energy are doing. Thank you so much for taking the time today to share with us your insights around your rapid growth journey as a company, uh, the criticality of wind and solar to the future state of clean energy, and your observations about this conversation uh, and the role of business and government in this transition as well, more broadly. It's absolutely inspiring. We're grateful for your example, and we're very grateful for your contribution to the Trailblazers series. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to EY for partnering with us to amplify people following the path of most resistance. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and subscribe to the series. Are you a trailblazer or inspired by a trailblazer? Leave a comment, let us know, join the movement.